This is section 17.6, surface integrals. We're coming up on the very end of the class here, and the main goals of the whole class are Green's theorem, Stokes' theorem, and the divergence theorem. We finished Green's theorem, which basically had two forms. It said that if you are in the plane, you can measure circulation using an integral on the inside of the region, and you can measure flux by doing an integral on the inside of the region. The issue that comes up when we're dealing in three dimensions is that your surface piece of paper is that your surface instead of being in the plane like it is in Green's theorem your surface might be all wonky and it's sitting here in three dimensions like all curvy or something if we can get Green's theorem to work on surfaces like this then we've got Stokes theorem and the divergence theorem so we need one more section, which is how do you do integrals on the inside of a surface when the surface is all wonky in three dimensions? That's this section. This section is pretty long. It's got 11 pages of notes, um, and it's pretty technical. The payoff is those two theorems at the end, which were like the whole point of calculus. So let's do it. We're gonna define a surface integral, use the surface integral to find a mass, and then we'll do flux through a surface. Yeah, so first, um, we need to parameterize surfaces. So remember the idea is that we used to parameterize curves like all the time. We had to parameterize a curve to do a line integral. What you would do is you'd just make up a parameter, t, and you'd say, well, um, for each t, we will get a point in space. And if for each value of t, you get a point in space, then that object traces out a curve in space. This kind of object is a function that takes as input one number, t, time, and its output is a point in space. It's this kind of thing up here. Now that parameterizes a curve in space. It can tell you like, hey, to follow this shape, use this r of t equals these three functions. If you want to parameterize a surface, well, now you need two parameters. Ooh, variables? It's important that they're parameters. Instead of using t for time, because like that doesn't really work, instead I'll use u and v. And the idea here is like, we will take a region in the xy plane, except it'll be the uv plane, and we'll say, this is our map of the surface. So, I mean, you know this, right? When you look at a map of like a city, the map is not literally what the surface looks like. The map is like a flat version of it. The real actual surface of the city is like all curvy and wonky in three dimensions. If you pick a point on the map that corresponds to a point like in the city, maybe this one is up on a plateau and this one is like down near the river valley, but the, the shapes are actually different. And that's what a parameterization is. A parameterization of a surface is like drawing a map of the surface on a flat piece of paper. Well, easy for me to say. How do we actually do it? Um, so let's, let's try to see it. So we'll find a parametric description for a cylinder that has radius A and height H. And it's important here that we're talking about a cylinder in the sense of this class, where a cylinder is a surface. So it's, it doesn't include the interior of this cylinder. It's not like a three-dimensional solid object. It's like a, it's just the outside. So how do we, how can we parameterize this? Well, the z value, can, we can say the z value goes from z equals zero up to z equals h. And then other than the z value, what other coordinate would you need like to pick a point here? Well, you could say that like z goes from zero to h, and then you also need to know where you are on the, like around the circle. So some good parameters might be z and theta. So let's see how to do that, how to like actually write it. Your parameterization should be r of uv just like our parameterization of a curve was r of t. And you should imagine what, what you're thinking of as these coordinates. And I've decided that my coordinates are gonna be theta and z. So I can put v in the z slot, that's pretty easy. 
Ah. And then what do I put in the X and Y slots? Well, if I know theta, then I can figure out where I am in X and Y by doing R cosine theta, R sine theta. My radius is A. So the X slot is A cosine theta, A sine theta. So this is my parameterization. I decided that a good parameterization for a cylinder was basically like cylindrical coordinates, but you call them U and V. And this is kind of like how sometimes you called the parameter of your curve T, even though it was really X. What else do you need for a parameterization? You need bounds for the two variables. Well, u is going to go from 0 to 2 pi, and v is going to go, because it has height h, v is going to go from 0 to h. And this is a cylinder, the surface, a cylinder of radius a and height h, is this parameterization. Let's do some more. You'll get used to it. So here's a parameterization of a cone. It's, it looks crazy. It's v cosine u, v sine u, v. The question asks, explain how traces for values of v generate the cone. So the point of this kind of question is to remind you that whenever you have something crazy that's made of lots of variables, you should just try what happens when one of the variables equals 0. When v is 0, you get r of u 0. I'm plugging in 0 for all the v's is 0, 0, 0. So at v equals 0, I get a point at the origin. What if v is 1? If v is 1, I get cosine u, sine u, 1. What is cosine u, sine u, 1? This is a vector-valued function that only has one parameter, so it's a curve in space. So once you pick a value of v, you get a curve. And this curve is a circle at z equals 1 with radius 1. So you go up to z equals 1, and you get a circle with radius 1. If you pick different values of v, v equals 2, you get another curve. r of u2 is 2 cosine u, I'm just plugging in v equals 2 everywhere. 2 cosine u, 2 sine u, 2. This is a circle of radius 2 at height 2. <laughs> so each v that you pick gives you a height, and that v tells you also the radius of a circle, and that's how you build a cone. If you wanted to check your work to example 1, you could do that. If you pick a value for any variable, Say you pick u equals pi. I picked an angle for u because I knew that it was uh, supposed to be an angle. Then r of pi v, literally plugging in pi for every u, uh, v. Cosine pi is minus 1. Sine pi is 0. This is a curve, and this curve is x equals minus a, so it's like back, um, wait, where's x? I guess the x-axis is this way. So we're in the back corner, y is 0, and z can be anything. So u equals pi is the curve that's just the back of this cylinder. It's a vertical line that's on the a vertical line segment that's on the back of the cylinder. If you instead pick like plug in a number for v, let's just try v equals 1, then you'll get a cosine u, a sine u, 1. This is a circle at height 1 and it goes all the way around. So that's a circle this way. So if you pick a value for one of the parameters, you get a curve in space, and those curves of the different, like, they're different levels. If you pick different v's on the cylinder, you'll get all the different circles. If you pick different u's on the cylinder, you'll get all the different vertical lines going all the way around. 
And so you can like check your work or understand a parameterization of a surface by just plugging in values of one of the variables and seeing what curve you get. On to the next page. So let's try to parameterize some crazy surface. So here I've got a sphere of radius four. Nice circle. <laughs> I'm in this like advanced drawing program and I'm not using the circle tool. Oh well. So I have a sphere of radius four. I'm only looking at the part where z is at least two root two, which is like almost all the way up at the top. So I just want the cap of the sphere up here. The question is, how do you parameterize that part of a sphere? And the answer is, well, what is the best set of coordinates for a sphere? <laughs> I said the answer is, and then I said a question. But the answer is that you should use spherical coordinates. Spherical coordinates had rho, theta, phi, where, let's just remember what these are. Rho, this is an R. This is a Greek R. It's not a P. I should make it maybe slantier. Why is it an R? It's an R because it's radius. So spherical coordinates have the radius. Theta is like the longitude around the sphere. And phi is like the latitude on the sphere, except that the North Pole is latitude zero. So um, we're going to try to do this in spherical coordinates. Um, rho is always four for this sphere. Theta can go all the way around, and phi can go from like the top down to this angle. So this, these will be our these two remaining coordinates that don't have a fixed value. That will be my u and my v. So idea. U should be theta, and v should be phi. Okay, so let's try to make it happen. I'm gonna let r of u v be. Now here's where it gets really dicey, is that. I need to give this in terms of x, y, and z, even though I was thinking in spherical coordinates. So I need to put x here, y here, and z here. Well, to do that, I can look up how spherical coordinates work. If I've decided that I'm just thinking in spherical coordinates where rho is 4, u is theta, and v is phi, then like I can look up how spherical coordinates work. Um, I don't really feel like opening up a whole thing to get all the formulas, so I'm just going to write down these two triangles that told me how spherical coordinates work. It's This is the polar one, and then there's the spherical one, which had phi up here, rho, z, r. So these are the two triangles that contain everything about uh, spherical coordinates. I need to find x, y, and z using this. You could just look up the formulas for what x equals in spherical coordinates, I guess, if you wanted. But I don't want to look it up. So x is r cosine theta. And r is rho sine theta. Oops, rho sine phi. The reason x is r cosine theta is because x is adjacent to theta. And the reason r is rho sine phi is because phi, r is opposite from phi. Y is um, R sine theta. And then R is rho sine phi. Similarly, we can get Z. Z is adjacent to phi, so it's just rho whoops, cosine phi. So if I drop all this in here, X is supposed to be rho, rho is 4, sine phi, I'm calling phi V cosine theta, which I'm calling u. y is rho, that's 4, sine v, cosine u. Ran out of space. Also, these arrows are pointing the wrong way. <laughs> and then z is rho, that's 4, cosine phi, that's v.
So this is my parameterization, x, y, z, in terms of, ah, I wrote phi, in terms of u and v. Phi is called v. The only other thing you need for a parameterization is you need to write the bounds for the parameters. u is definitely going to go from 0 to 2 pi, because this goes all the way around the sphere. phi is a little bit more confusing, because definitely the minimum latitude is going to be 0. That's the, it, like the North Pole is part of my spherical cap. But then what is the latitude of this point where z equals 2 root 2? So let's see. Um, at that point, I'm going to use this triangle. Rho is 4. Z is 2 root 2. And I want to know what phi equals. OK, well, I guess I can use this formula. Like, I want, I want the formula that has z, rho, and phi in it. So z, whatever, cosine phi is adjacent over hypotenuse. So it's 2 root 2 over 4. And that's root 2 over 2. Well, can you think of a phi where cosine phi is root 2 over 2? That's phi equals pi over 4. So that's the end of my parameterization. I realized that I had a piece of a sphere, so I used spherical coordinates. Then I figured out which of the spherical coordinates were fixed. In this case, it was rho was fixed at 4. And the other two were going to vary a little bit. So I used those to be u and v. Then I went and looked up how spherical coordinates work. Or in my case, I'm averse to looking stuff up, so I just have these triangles memorized, which allow me to build everything from scratch. And that told me that x was rho sine phi cosine theta, y was some other thing, and z was some other thing. Then I get the bounds for the parameterization, and I'm done. So this is a parameterization for the, sp the spherical cap. Kind of nice. Um, I, I think that you should be a little bit annoyed by this, because like it's kind of coming out of nowhere, and we were like almost done with the class, and now all of a sudden here's some more like some more like mechanisms to use where like we were supposed to be getting payoffs yeah well <laughs> i want to do green's theorem on a surface but the surface i want the surface to be able to be curved like this cap of a sphere green's theorem on a curved surface will be either will be one of the two theorems that's left in the class okay so let's do some uh oh that's not what i wanted let's do some surface integrals using these surfaces once, you, once we've parameterized a curve in the line integrals section, we were able to do line integrals over that curve. Once we parameterize a surface, now we can do surface integrals on that surface. So let's say you have a function, f, that's defined on the surface, and the surface has a parameterization. So the function f defined on the surface, it could be like the temperature at, the, at that point of the surface. So you've got this spherical cap, and maybe it's like really warm in the middle, so f is large in the middle, and f is lower on the outsides. So you've got some like function, and you've got some surface. Let's just assume that everything is really like continuous, and that we're not going to worry too much about that in this class, because it's a 200 level class. Then what would the integral of the function over the surface mean? Like how would we do that? Well, what you would do is you'd go look at your map of the surface. Your map of the surface is over here in the uv plane, where like you've got some bounds for u and you've got some bounds for v. Kind of like how this spherical cap, my map of it in the uv plane it has like a rectangle that u goes from 0 to 2 pi and v goes from 0 to pi over 4. That's a weird map of the North Pole, but that's the map I had. So you go look at your map and you say, well, let's go, let's, even though the function is defined on the surface, let's look at what's going on over here and we'll try to do the integrals over here with respect to u and v. So. Um, what's the main thing we're going to have to worry about? I guess the main thing we'll have to worry about is that because my map is kind of like inaccurate in a certain way, that some of these little boxes in the UV plane 
map over here to like really big areas. And some of the boxes maybe on the end might map to like really small areas. <clears throat> because of that, it will end up mattering what the area is that we're mapping to. That's the that's going to be the key term that's going to show up. It's like, what's the area of the piece of S that we're looking at? How do we do this? Well, we're going to try to find the area of this little piece, this little like mapped out piece of the surface is what we're trying to find the area of. And the key insight is that if you go look at these tangent vectors, these tangent vectors will make a little parallelogram. And the area of this little parallelogram is pretty close to the area of this like slice of the surface. I don't know if you remember how to find the area of the parallelogram, but the area of a parallelogram, and it was so long ago, it was in chapter 13. Area of a parallelogram made by two vectors. Oh, I can't really call them U and V. <laughs> so many letters are reserved. The area of a parallelogram made by, I don't know, alpha and beta, two vectors, is you cross them and take the magnitude. So if we could figure out what these tangent vectors were, we could get the scaling factor of this little area by crossing the two tangent vectors and taking the magnitude. <laughs> okay, um, we're gonna work our way through this and, and at the end we will get a formula for how to, um, how to find a surface integral of a function on a surface. So let's do, a <laughs> we're looking at a certain spot here, a certain spot where like, uh, there's a certain value of u and v and then we're moving a little bit in the u direction, that's delta u, and a little bit in the v direction, that's delta v. So let's have a little change delta u with v fixed. Then how does r change? Ooh, not gradient. Change in r would be r after you've moved by a little bit minus the original r. U and V aren't vectors. U and V are like your coordinates on your map. And R tells you where you are actually on the surface. Okay, the rate of change of R with respect to U is this. Yeah, that's what it is can be approximated. I mean, if you were going to approximate it, you would get r of u plus delta u v minus r of u v, all divided by delta u. But as you let delta u go to zero, you get this. Huh. Okay, so anyway, the point is that the change in r, if you're just moving in the u direction, is um, that the delta r in the u direction is this tangent vector. times delta u. This tu is this thing. I'm not making this make any sense. <laughs> this is just what this means. This is just what the tangent vector means. Okay, I don't know. I botched this explanation. I'm sorry. But the tangent vector tells you like how much you move in that direction, like based on how much you moved. Okay, so we're trying to find the area. The area comes from this like cross product of these parallelograms. So we're going to um, find the area, area of SK is approximately, take the cross product of these two vectors and take their magnitude. but I have those written in this way. It's like T U delta U cross T V delta V. And this delta U and delta V are scalars that I can factor out. So I'm gonna end up with T U cross T V delta U delta V. And the end result of what we will use for this, like what, what is the point of this, is that my formula at the end is gonna have this T U cross T V with magnitude, and then I'll have du dv at the end. 
So what we're actually calculating here, this scaling factor, it's kind of like when we switched from xy to r theta. dx dy didn't equal dr d theta. dx dy equaled r dr d theta. And similarly here, when we're like trying to get onto our surface and we're trying to use these weird variables u and v, we don't get just du dv, we get this scaling factor, it's called the Jacobian, and it's the magnitude of tu cross tv. So that's what's going to show up here in our, in our formula. So let me just write the formula at the end here. If you try to integrate a function over a surface, what you can do is parameterize the surface over this region that's based in u and v. So this looks like, so this is an integral over a surface that's like a curved surface. And we don't know how to do that. It's kind of like when we said, here's an integral over a curve, a line integral. We defined it as, oh, okay, switch over to a parameterization of the curve. This is the exact same thing. We say, how do you do an integral on a surface? Well, you switch over to an integral on this parameterization. You get your function. Now your function needs to be in terms of u and v. I'm just going to leave f here. But then the scaling factor that you need, that like the cost you pay for switching to du and dv, is this thing. Tu cross tv. Take the magnitude. OK, um, we're going to need to do examples. But basically, all of that, all of this stuff on this page was the justification for why the Jacobian, this scaling factor, why this scaling factor needed to be tu cross tv with uh, the magnitude of that vector. And it's just the scaling factor of the area. Okay, what does this surface integral actually do? If you integrate just the number one, then you get the surface area of the surface. Because if the integral, if the function you're integrating is just the number one, then like this isn't here and this isn't here, then all you're doing is adding up all the little areas of all the little pieces of the surface. So you get the surface area. I think we get to do an example. Yeah, good, okay. So we'll do the surface area. Um, we're gonna find the surface area of a torus and it's gonna be the like a donut. It's got a hole in the middle and it will be the torus we get by spinning a circle of radius A around the Z axis. So like you take this circle in the, in the YZ plane, sure. Take the circle in the YZ plane and spin it around the end result is that this circle that I've traced out on the top is this circle on the top of the torus and this circle I've traced out on the bottom you can't see it it's on the bottom of the torus you can see it back there so let's find the surface area of this donut <laughs> Because it's a surface in three dimensions, but it's not a flat surface, I need to parameterize it. This is the key. It's just like when we did line integrals. The key to computing a line integral was to just parameterize the curve. And once you parameterize the curve, if you can keep track of what everything is, then you'll be able to find the line integral. Same deal here. If you can parameterize the surface, the formula looks scary, but it's actually just telling you to substitute a bunch of things in. <laughs> so let's parameterize the surface and then it will work out. Um, how can we, I guess it's gonna actually be a little bit tricky to get the parameterization. The picture, the, this diagram is telling us hints of what u and v should equal to make everything work out for us. So let's do that. Let's use their, let's use the hints in the picture. So it tells us that the radius, like how thick the donut is, is A, and how big the hole is in the middle is B. And then it tells us that, hey, you should probably use U to measure like how far around, around the donut you are, and use V to measure, they're both how far around the donut you are. <laughs> Use different values of u to be different different values around this way, and use different values of v to be different values around this way. So let's try to do that. 
I'm going to have to decide what x is, what y is, and what z is, now that I've decided what u and v are supposed to stand for. Okay, um, x does not depend on u at all, does it? Oh, maybe it does. Oh no, it does. <laughs> Okay, sweet. This is kind of complicated. Let's do z first. z looks like the easiest. Um, z doesn't depend on v. So as as you go around the torus, the v the v way, it doesn't change how high you are up and down in the z direction. Z depends entirely on u. What is z? Well, z is how high you are, and you can get a right triangle in here, and see that z is a sine of u because z is um, opposite from the angle u. So that one's, that one's much easier. For x and y, seems like pretty tricky. Like we're gonna want a cosine u because a cosine u is this amount. So this distance out to where you are is gonna be b plus a cosine u. So you can kind of measure in the xy plane, your distance to the, to the middle is this b plus a cosine u. Once you realize that, that like, what am I measuring? I'm measuring like the distance to the middle, but only in the xy direction. That has a name that's called r in polar coordinates. So this is r, and then v is like theta in polar coordinates. Once you figure this out, then you can tell that x is r cosine theta and y is r sine theta. Here's r and here's theta. So you can drop those in. So x is going to be r cosine theta. y is r sine theta. And z we figured out before. So this is my parameterization. Just like with line integrals, almost all the work is done in figuring out the parameterization. So you shouldn't think of this as like the preliminaries. You should think of this as like, holy crap, this was the hard part. <laughs> with the parameterization done, now we can find the surface area. So what is the surface area? The surface area is this surface integral over the surface s with no other function in here, just ds. And we know from our definition on the previous page how to do this. We use our map that's the parameterization in terms of u and v. I've got this, these bounds that I've added in here from 0 to 2 pi on u and 0 to 2 pi on v. That is the bounds that we'll end up using for our integral. Well, what happened in that formula was we had the magnitude of tu cross tv was our scaling factor that we had to use to integrate with respect to u and v. Both bounds just go from 0 to 2 pi. So if we can figure out what tu cross tv's magnitude is, then we will be in good shape. Now, you should imagine that this, this parameterization, this is not great. Like, this is, this is a huge mess. And so you need to use some simplifying tactics to make your life easier. The main simplifying tactic you need to use is, when possible, factor out scalars. So this is a skill that makes horrible problems into not horrible problems. When you have a vector and it's all multiplied by something, factor it out. Factor out the scalar. Deal with the scalar separately. Um, you'll see what I mean here in a second. So first let's find tu. tu is just the u partial derivative of this parameterization. So it's going to be partial x partial u, partial y partial u, partial z partial u. And remember the tactic that we're going to use is, yes, I'm going to have to take all these partial derivatives, but I'm going to factor out all of the scalars that I can see that are a scalar multiple of the whole vector. So u partial derivative. The x slot has b cosine v, which doesn't do anything. It has no u's in it. We're doing the u partial. So then a cosine u cosine v, I can take the u partial derivative of that. It's minus a sine u cosine v. 
Similar deal here with partial y partial u. b sine v is not important. a cosine u sine v I can take the u partial derivative of. And then partial z partial u, that has some u's in it. So I'll have a cosine u. Which parts of this are scalars and which parts actually involve the variables? Well, a is a scalar and the whole vector is multiplied by a. So you save yourself so much time and energy if you factor the a out. It's not like the a is gone. We didn't divide the vector by a. We're remembering that the a exists. It's right here. But like keeping it out there is super important. Okay, what's tv? tv is take all the v partial derivatives. Okay, what do you get? This is a constant times cosine v, so its partial derivative is that same constant times the derivative of cosine v, so I'll have minus sine v. Then same deal here, I have a constant times sine v, so the derivative is that constant times cosine v. And this third component has no v's in it, so its v partial derivative is zero. Um, is any of this like a multiple, like a scalar multiple? And the answer is yes. The whole thing, every, t every single component here has a b plus a cosine u in it. So this seems very weird because this doesn't look like a scalar to you probably because you might be thinking of a scalar as a constant. But the scalar can have variables in it. It's just anything that every part of the vector is multiplied by. So b plus a cosine u, I can factor out and I'll get minus sine v cosine v zero. This is so valuable and important, it saves you so much effort. So just watch out for anything that, that, the, that can be factored out of your vector. That's a scalar, even if it has variables in it. So now we're supposed to find tu cross tv. Finding the cross product of huge terrible vectors is a ridiculous task, but if you factor the scalars out, you can factor the scalars out of the cross product also. And then you can just find the cross product of the pieces of the vectors that you actually have to have. So we're just gonna do the vector part here and the vector part here. I uh, has minus sine u cosine v and minus sine v. J has minus sine u sine v and cosine v, and k has cosine u and zero. To get, the, to get the cross product, I need to take the determinant of this three by three matrix, which I'll do by copying down the first two columns, but you can do however you want. And the thing you should be imagining is how much more ridiculous this would be if we had not factored out b plus a cosine u, because b plus a cosine u would be everywhere, and it would be absurd. So tu cross tv, it's a vector. Here's a scalar on the outside of it. We'll go forward, get 0i. Forward is minus cosine u sine v j. Forward here is minus sine u cosine squared v k. Then going backwards, this is in the k slot. It's minus sine v, or wait, minus sine u sine squared v k. This one is minus cosine u cosine v i. And this way is nothing. So what is tu cross tv? It's a vector. Here's a scalar that's on the outside of it. And the vector is in the i slot minus cosine u cosine v. In the j slot minus cosine u sine v. And in the k slot, um, cosine squared v plus sine squared v will factor out and be 1. So I'll just have minus sine u. 
Okay, what are we doing with this vector? We're finding its magnitude. Again, we get massively rewarded here, which is that this scalar is just part of the magnitude. And then I can just find the magnitude of this vector, which is square root of square all these things and add them all up. I don't know if you can see what's coming here, but cosine squared u has a piece of cosine squared u and another piece of cosine squared u, and those pieces add up to one. So this, this term all added together is cosine squared u. Cosine squared u plus sine squared u is also one. So this whole thing is, this whole square root thing is one. This vector I have left over is a unit vector. So the magnitude of tu cross tv is a times b plus a cosine u times one. So it's this. Sweet. So that was, the, I mean, that was crazy, but you get massively rewarded if you factor scalars out of vectors. So please do that. If you ever have a ridiculous vector, factor out some common factor from it and write it out on the outside as a scalar. This integral has this tu cross tv magnitude dropped in it. So this is what we're actually integrating. I don't know if I have any space to actually do this integral anywhere on the page. Can I like make the page bigger? <laughs> Maybe like pick up everything. <laughs> I guess I'll open a blank page here to finish the integral. Okay, so the surface area is the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to 2 pi, and it was magnitude of tu cross tv, du dv. It just so happened that magnitude of tu cross tv was b times a plus b cosine u or something like this. Let's look back at it. a times b plus a cosine u. It's b plus a cosine u. <laughs> Completely backwards. a times b plus a cosine u, du dv. So now we can just do this integral. The u integral of all this stuff is what we'll do first. The v integral is waiting for us to be done. The u integral of all this stuff is a times b u plus a sine u. This goes from 0 to 2 pi. These are the u bounds. Um, when I plug 0 or 2 pi into sine u, I get 0. So all this stuff is gone. So I end up with a b 2 pi. This integral has no v's in it. So the integral from 0 to 2 pi just multiplies it by 2 pi. So this is going to be my final answer. It's 4 pi squared AB. This is the volume of a donut. It's 4 pi squared AB cubic units, where A is the radius of... A is like the thickness of the actual donut part, and B is like how far it is from the middle of the hole out to the middle of the donut part. <laughs> That's just your formula for the, wait, is it volume? It can't be volume. I said volume, but it can't be volume because AB is like meters times meters, so it's square meters. Oh, it's surface area. <laughs> so this is the surface area of a donut. Okay, that was a crazy calculation. I think what I should do here is stop the video and cut it into two parts. Um, but the takeaways you were supposed to get from that are, first of all, what is going on with this tu cross tv? Like, what does it actually mean? And what it means is you take your parameterization and you take u partial derivatives, that's tu, and you take v partial derivatives, that's tv. Then you do a cross product, and this is an even more important takeaway is that if you're working with vectors, don't just accept the vectors as they are. Factor scalars out of them so you don't have to deal with the crazy scalars by writing them over and over. Okay.
um, I'll see you for part two.